Um, he grew up in an art and music and TV ranch style house in the 1960s, exposed to creativity of all sorts. Uh, his mom is a self taught graphic designer and started a music teacher. Dad's the barber, and his great uncle was a textile worker. Child, he learned to problem solve and loved to paint. Whittington majored in art at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And after working in a cooperative art gallery uh, and the business world as a conceptual artist, he dreamed up the idea of taking old cigarette machines, enhancing their appearance with fresh paint and other custom details, and transforming them into a collective work of art called the Artomat. Currently, there are at least 120 of these machines sold at various sites around the world, and I'm sure Clark's going to correct me on that. It may be more than that now. <laughs> Um, but Whittington has grabbed, gathered together more than 300 artists that make up a group called Artists Cellophane, who fill these small cigarette sized packages of original works of art that can only be acquired through the art of that. So he is here today to talk to us about the project, his inspiration, um, and all kinds of good stuff. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Clark. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Does this, does this sound okay? Too loud? Okay, good, good. Well, I'm Clark. Um, I, I'm the founder of the Artemat Project. Basically, I'm here because I have an Artemat downstairs. Um, so we'll just get to it. Um, so I grew up in Concord, North Carolina. Um, uh, grew up on a farm. It was a mill town. But I think our family was maybe a little more progressive than many. We had lots of funky things hanging around. Um, I'm the one holding the ukulele on the bottom picture, that triangular-shaped uh, guitar called the Singing Trahola Peak. But basically, uh, my mom, she had her First job working for Belk Stores in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she got her art degree through a correspondence course in the 50s. So back in the 50s, the only place to really go to art school would be New York or Florida. And if you didn't have the money or the nerve, um, but still wanted to do art or something, she did this. So she drew the, the pirate, the turtle, things like that. It was on the back of Matchbooks um, magazines. Um, this is me in kindergarten, and which caused me to get beat up in the neighborhood by the older kids in the neighborhood. But uh, I was on the local paper. So I, would, I was always making things in high school. I played football, and I would make the banners that the team would, would bust out of. So I kind of hindsight, I like to think of that as my first art because it was meant to not last. It was an idea. So we spend all week doing something only to tear it to shreds. Um, and I received a uh, senior superlative of most artistic. I had a car at the time that matched my haircut with tires on the front and arch on the back. Uh, it was a Chevelle. <laughs> so anyway, um, even though Concord was a fairly traditional town and North Carolina was traditional, um, there were a lot of people who um, worked in the textile mills area. And um, basically, socks and hosiery would be made in North Carolina, Kannapolis, Concord. But the clients were in New York City. So my mom, who... Um, worked in the South. She had to go to New York periodically for client meetings, and she didn't want to fly up by herself. So in high school and college, I would go with her, and I got to experience things that I wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, and she actually had clients in the Empire State Building, which was kind of nice. Some of these old hosiery barons were really pleasant, like act treat me like I was a nephew or something. But 
Um, it's the first time I had a Reuben sandwich. I uh, noticed that one couple took all the leftovers when we went out to eat. And as I got older, I probably realized why that was, because they had most likely fled Europe in World War II. Clothes. So, so they're very thrifty, but uh, my mom had clients up in New York, so I got to see stuff. So we'd go to museums, and, uh, you know, North Carolina, it was a place where you would see landscapes, watercolors. That was boring to me. Um, I, I was a big fan of Robert Rauschenberg because the whole assemblage approach just was right up my alley. My whole family were pack rats anyway, so we had things laying around that could be translated into art very easily. Um, and at Appalachian State, um, feels a little loud, but everybody's cool? <laughs> okay. Okay, good, good. Um, it's a little earthy, so I started moving towards a more hippie, less materialistic mindset. Really like some of the conceptual work by like Robert Smithson, Viral Jetty. Um, I actually met Keith Herring on one of my trips to New York when I was in college, and he, he signed uh, the bag that I bought my T-shirt in, which I later wore that T-shirt to propose to my wife. But, uh, but I got to see the pop shop, and it was still more of an art installation. Adventure. So he had just like a few T-shirts, a few knickknacks, had prints. It was kind of an interesting, it was more like an, I view it as an art installation. Um, Keith Herring Foundation, they no longer longer have it. Uh, they kind of moved towards the mindset of the gap when they were, after he passed away, and putting this art on everything. <laughs> but it was kind of cool to see this small space that he painted, and he was actually there. So a few seconds, got to chat with him. And uh, Richard Heinzel, uh, this is, I for, keep forgetting this guy. He's He's a reclusive conceptual artist who works out in the desert. And this piece, he actually would do donuts on him with a motorcycle and then take pictures in a helicopter. So he would do drawings that can only be seen from the sky. And uh, so that's the type of stuff I liked. Um, so after college, uh, I started a gallery with two buddies of mine in a area of, of Charlotte called North Davison. Now it's called Noda. Actually, it was started in 1988, and our gallery lasted around two and a half, three years. Really rough. Um, if any students are here who uh, were to the wise, if you, if you set up shop somewhere that's affordable and you like it, if you really like it, buy the building, because as soon as the consumer-friendly acronym comes into play, they're going to get you out of there. <laughs> and I've had two art districts in North Carolina that um, actually went from just a regular intersection to a kitschy name, and that's when the rent went up. So, But we were doing some, some funky things that were very against the idea of capitalism and selling. We, this is a piece called A Frame of Shame. What I would do is, I always loved Polaroids, the kind that would peel apart, which are no longer made except for one company in Vienna. Very expensive now. But I would carry one of those pack film cameras around, take a picture with all day where I'm hanging out with friends, whatever, work. Come home, stay up late, and just work middle of the night and frame these pieces based on the subject matter in the photograph. And the, the name Frame of Shame comes about from a college professor who came into a gallery before I started this and my, saw one of my pieces. Like, well, you get an A plus on con, concept, but a D minus or an F on craftsmanship. And I, I view that as a success. And I just dug in deeper. And a lot of the art that I made <clears throat> back then was not meant to last. A lot of it ended up in dumpsters. Um, it was based on observations and experiences. And it, some of the pieces are still around, which are nice to have, but most of them are no longer. So that leads to the Artemat. Um, I stopped making art 
for a while in the early 90s just to work in advertising, make a living. I just got married in 91. Um, moved to Winston-Salem, which is the home of, used to be the home of RJR Cigarettes, uh, Tobacco Town, as well as underwear and donuts. That's the three things that Winston was famous for. Go figure. <laughs> uh, maybe eat, eat bad stuff, smoke bad stuff, and have to change your underwear. I don't know. But um, that's what we're known for. So when I moved to Winston, um, cigarette machines were being banned by the federal government so kids couldn't buy cigarettes. I found one, but before that, a friend of mine saw my sketchbook, because I'd always carry a sketchbook with me. And he, the one on the left that says crinkle, I intended to have a installation sort of assemblage piece that would look like a vending machine and hold my photographs. Um, he saw it and said, hey, these machines are going to be banned. Why don't you get one? So I went to a vending company, and um, they laughed at me, and they pointed over to the back lot and said, we have 300 more for you when you're ready. And they gave, helped me load one into the truck. <laughs> so this was my first show when I moved to Winston. And I only had a month to make this piece. So I ripped it all apart. And then I worked in a basement, studio was. And that created the first Artemat. So I was selling small works art for a dollar in quarters. Um, after the show was over at this coffee shop, the owner said, you can't take this. We like it so much. It's just, but okay, well, let's, let's invite, you know, artists here in town to help keep it filled because I, I don't, it'll wear me out. So um, that's where uh, the Artemat project went from a me to a we. So at this point, it was one of 13 pieces in the show. But once I started inviting people to be involved, I, wanted to respect their efforts, and I view it as a group collaborative installation project to this day. So, in the first month of the show, it was really interesting. People didn't know what to make of it. They, this coffee shop would be open to three in the morning. People would be three sheets to the wind, want, want their money back after they had art and went up to the counter. <laughs> Just like, Sorry, man, you got to live with your art, you know. So um, during that month, towards the end of the exhibit, the machine state, all the paintings went off the wall. Um, before that came down, the owner of the coffee shop had a regular who was a police officer. And he wanted to know about my art. He was really interested in anything like this. So I went around each piece and explained the story. And they all had a backstory. Um, and did I explain the concept of Artemat? Sometimes I kind of just turned 56. Sometimes I kind of flake out. <laughs> well, the Artemat was based on a friend of mine who had a Pavlovian reaction. So he would go to a vending machine and he'd hear the crinkle of cellophane habitually. So that's the concept. Why I wanted to put art in a vending machine, make it so people would want to live with art. So, okay, so there's that. Sorry. Um, this police officer went through and told off. Oh, let me tell all the stories. And at the end of the, after I walked through, he said, well, your art is right smart. And I view that as the best compliment to date that I've had um, because right smart is not a, that art critics use, like that Picasso is right smart. You know, it's more like your mean uncle where you have to bail hay all day Saturday and you, maybe at the end of the day, they'll say, well, you're a smart worker. I mean, that, so I realized from that quote that something was up with Artemat, and maybe there was something to it, because I thought it was going to go away after the first month. I thought I was going to scrap the machine myself. So, so that's when um, people saw the first Artemat. We got a little bit of local NPR press. Um, public radio and some things. And we slowly started expanding. And I use the term we because I, I feel that everyone who's involved, whether it's a host, an artist, or a studio, is part of this whole process. 
So what was happening with the Artemat early on was people were intrigued with um, the reuse, swords in the plowshares aspect of Artemat. They knew what the machines were used for. They were um, in great condition to this day. They're very dependable. They're, they were designed to be in rowdy bars and still function. Uh, and coming from the state of North Carolina, where Jesse Helms made it his point to try to build the NEA, um, I saw that people had a preconceived idea of if art was valuable or not. But being a conceptual artist in the South, I had to work around people that maybe didn't agree with views. But what I learned is if I explain my art to people, that they would respond positively and sometimes help out or, you know, don't alienate people, then I think that's a good thing. And that's what I've done with Artemat. I think that uh, the fact that we're inviting people to make and sell art is a good thing. And with the culture in this country, is better now, but I do think that we we look at things and and do a snap judgment of their value. And artists are on the one end that seems like it's not necessary. And and I disagree with that in full. I think people need to live with art. And judging by what we sell per year now, I think right, we sell around ninety thousand pieces a year out of the network. So so there's plenty of people who may have um, gone into a gallery and didn't understand it, felt intimidated. But with this, we're just inviting people to experience it at an affordable cost. So there's some of my theory. Um, so this was 97 is when I started. We're on our 25th year now. We have a big event in Carolina on May 14th. Say around 1999, we were invited to to um, be in the after NPR national NPR story um, drive time radio. A lot of people heard it. The Whitney Museum called and said they wanted an artemat. So that's when I decided maybe I should restore these machines versus just put a label on it that says artemat. Uh, this is one that's now in Palm Springs, California. But over the, and it's a recent machine, but um, this thing set out, broke my foot in 2018, and it set out in the rain for six months, but it all, a Connecticut basement. So with that said, as more reputable venues signed on, it was necessary to kind of trick things out versus just being crunchy and just slapping paint on them. So that's what this machine looks like now. So the whole goal is to get respect for the artist through a presentation that removes the smelly past and blah, blah, blah. So some venues, we um, really restore them. Others, we, we clear coat the patina still. Some of our brewery venues actually prefer the roughness and the kitsch. Um, this machine was in Baptist Hospital, Wake Forest University, you know, hospital in Winston. Um, they had a cultural division at the time, and they had artists help keep it filled. They, I wanted to do something that was reflective that it was a hospital. Um, and even here, I think the machine reflects some of the sci-fi stuff that in that. In that so we won't our venues to be happy with their machine for years to come because they have to look at it. Uh, so they gave me access to x-rays and I thought about doing something that looked like a x-ray light on the wall where you make it funny like artist brain and a heart. And then I was like, well, that's morbid. So we went with the operation motif game. So this machine lights up and buzzes when you pull the knob. So it's, it's now at Renolda House Museum of American Art, which is still part of Wake Forest University. 
around 2010 is when we had a large surge of um, this activity. And the odd thing with Arnomat is I never thought I would do this as a business. Uh, really don't have the best business sense. But, uh, but you know, we, we're here um, despite my resistance of everything out in the world. <laughs> you know, I just want this to be an art project that people enjoy. Well, um, at times I think the project's just going to die. Nose dive, like we're done, stick a fork in it. And then next thing you know, there's a surge. And then we, we're so busy we can't even think straight. And we're in that position right now with the bounce back from the pandemic. We're almost out of art on every day. So we'll discuss how you can be involved if you care to be after I quit babbling here. But um, we need art. and we. Uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum contacted us. And this is a museum that's not on the National Mall, so they have to work harder to get people to walk in the door. Um, I spoke with another art museum on the National Mall, and they were not very kind with their way they treated me on the mall. They contacted me about hosting, but they were snobby. This bunch, they're great. And this is the museum where the Obama portraits hung after they were on display and they were getting thousands of people on a Saturday, like 10, 30,000 people. Um, so we installed a machine there and um, that's what it is. So we're down in the Lucy Center, which is like a research area. If you look up to the top left, that's like a library, but it's works of art behind glass. They can be loaned out and people can research for studies. So, so here we are hanging out in this place where people can kind of just chill out. But it's a really neat place. The same year, um, one of our artists who was from Chicago had a friend who got hired to be curator at the Cosmopolitan Las Vegas. And this was an apartment venture that went south. Bank repossessed the whole building, then it became a casino. And um, so this was in 2010. They flew me out to meet me. They gave me a hard hat tour, and I couldn't even understand what they're doing. It was, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a huge place. And it's smaller than some of the other casinos. But the, um, the CEO, he used to run Caesar's Palace, uh, John Unwin. He was rolling dice the whole time. I was on his desk when he was talking to me. But I gave him, showed up with one of those cartons, and, and he was so happy. He's like, man, I wish you would have come here earlier. My day would have been a lot better, you know, if I'd have had this earlier. He just loved it. So basically, they understand that Artmat uh, has its own way of functioning. Um, you know, they make money on other things versus Artemat. So they're not turning the screws on us. They did sell. That day may happen. But but basically, they run the Artemat just like the one here. Everything's five bucks. Um, and they order around 2,500 pieces a month. So I just got a PO for an order on my phone right before I stepped up. So I had to send that to my studio manager. But we have six machines there littered throughout the property. So, uh, so anyway, it's a really lucky to be there. And they treat us as art, even though we're managed by the retail. But that's the cool thing about um, most of our venues. They understand that, you know, we're not legitimate capitalism. We're, we're PR. And with the income coming in, it's just one of those things. Um, this is a machine that I recently created during the pandemic. Um, I just threw this in the slideshow recently. I wanted to do vinyl, but supply side things that you may have heard on TV is real. And uh, so the vinyl guy I called, he rubbed me wrong. I was like, well, I'm going to do it myself. He pretty much said, can't make any money off of you. He didn't want to do the job. And I was like, 
what's your vinyl company? So uh, I sat down with contact paper and, and cut brisket, which I have not done since college, and spray painted with Montana paints, Artemat. Um, I think it turned out okay. And covered up uh, the word cigarettes with artists, and then there was a pack of Chesterfield for that piece of art as I just made that abstract piece. So basically, an Artemat is an old cigarette machine that now sells art. So when you go to an Artemat, you will see a number of selections and a two-inch square placard that will help you determine what's in each column. Within each column, it can be part of the same series, but maybe totally different from next piece. So say this landscape may have a tree on this one, but the next one may be a, a forest. Um, the most painters, two-dimensional artists, will, will paint on blocks. Our three-dimensional artists will put things in our boxes. So what you received will, you can, some of them just have boxes, others have blocks. So you share with your friends if you don't need one, if you want to, with Artemat, if you're going to submit something, we need to see a prototype, and that's on our cards. All the information's online, but uh, share the contents if you don't think. Uh, this this artist, she would do handmade books. So we're just going to go through some selections of of art. This is Nyoko Higashi, and she was involved before the internet was really that valid. Remember, I had dial-up internet. She actually mailed a letter from uh, Nara City, Japan. She would make small bead rings. And one story of hers that I thought was really cool. It, Artemat is a sleeper sort of thing. Like, I have not seen a single person look at the machine yet since I've been here, but I've only been here since yesterday. But it sells, you know. So it's common that I don't ever know who's buying things. There's hundreds of kids out there studying that got their life on, but we're over here doing our own thing. And fine with me because I like the connections made from the individual sale. I don't care about, you know, scalability. Actually, it's not a good thing for what we do. But this shows you how much reach a project like the Artemat has. So this, this person sent in an Artemat series from Japan. Uh, this person from Israel was in Chicago, took it home, and then emailed um, the artists in Japan. So it literally went around the world you know, from this little machine that just sits there and stays quiet until somebody puts in money and pulls them out. Did I have it in there twice? I had it in there twice. My apologies. Um, this is an artist who would do hot wax paintings, which are really beautiful. He'd use watercolors and paraffin wax. This artist would do um, wooden coins with uh, two things, one thing on each side, like the, the opposite. Uh, this is Medusa. I forget what was on the other side. Is there a nemesis of Medusa? I can't remember. <laughs> Um, but you could flip it. You know. So she would draw on the wood, dent it with her pencil, and then paint it. We had, uh, this is Kill Tope. He's an artist out of, I think, Detroit. He hasn't been involved in a long time. But we have graffiti artists. We have abstract artists. This artist would take old family photos and superimpose creepy cupy heads on top of people. Which, so the Artemat's open to any well-presented human concept. As long as it's worth five dollars, doesn't get us in trouble, can't get me arrested. <laughs> you know, <laughs> got to be on the up and up. Um, this is a doctor out of Germany. Um, she would paint aluminum foil black and then scratch off her drawings. This is a group uh, out of Oregon. It's a student group. So. They were all printmakers, so each student did their own thing. 
one person did uh, a raccoon figure. Others, that one did the stars and made little handmade stars. Another one did a panoramic piece. So they would load the whole class together as one addition. And then the money would go back to the point person and they would allocate it. Um, I don't know what they did with this money, but we had a student group in Nebraska, University of Nebraska. They would sell enough to give one student a scholarship, pay it forward to the next semester, and and they would vote on who deserved it. So, um, and that was good for for that group because students have a lot of demands on them, even if you're in art school and that's what you're doing. So, you know, our additions, we like to get 50 works at a time, single artist. But with a student group, if there's someone spearheading it, filtering the content, make sure it's all going to bend properly, maybe the students would only have to make 10 or 20 pieces. And then, so, and then it'll all go back to the point person, and they'll manage the funds. I think we've had about five or six student college groups over the 25 years. And, Come and go. This artist will make flowers out of wire. So some of the concepts are really striking, even though the materials are very inexpensive. This is my mom. She found these little easels somewhere, one of her clients at the time. And so you get a little painting with an easel you could set up. And a teacher, well, she worked at a museum. She's an education curator, now retired. Um, she was a pinhole photographer. So she would use the box to make pinhole camera. So if you see the, 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 the copper little hole there, that's the lens. And then it would also come with one of her photos. So you could use the box as a camera. She would give you instructions on how to do that. Um, so now we have around 175 machines that's out and about. I've not counted in the last year or two just because we're so busy. So they come home, we spruce them up, and they go back out. And that was what happened with the machine out here. Uh, the lunar lander machine was, uh, I feel, is very important to the project. It's very iconic. It was in Portland, Oregon. The venue was called Space, and I was like, would you mind if we made a spaceship? I always wanted to do one. Um, so me and two other artists designed it. Uh, he, one painted everything under the glass. The other is a sculptor who did the, the radar stuff. Uh, and I did the concept and did all the wiring and painting, had all the painting done. But, um, but I'm glad it's here because it's more appropriate in this venue looking uh, so, so that's that's the side portion. But I'm ready to answer questions if you have any. So, I hope that, I hope that sounded okay. <laughs> yes, yes, we um, we have. Um, it was all out of my basement garage until recently. Uh, as of late, we um, get back to the front. Um, we rented a space because of COVID. Um, had to reduce the foot traffic. But everything comes to the studio so that we can have quality control, we can manage the accounting, and, and abide by our liability insurance conditions. Um, so if you're wanting to submit, uh, most adults are mature enough to understand follow a process. Some don't understand why they can't just make a piece and go load it in there right now. But you know, it's we have to be in the loop. But um, but you know, if you do make work, we would want you to let us know that you're from here. Uh, you may want to be in that machine or other, and well, another George machine. But um, most of our big clients or hosts are Vegas or some of the larger museums. So 
So we'll need to send some to a place you may not be aware of, but most artists are really happy seeing where the reach goes. Because uh, if you do a hashtag on Instagram, when I send out checks to artists, I do that all myself. It's not fun, but I do it. <laughs> I'm not an accountant by any means whatsoever. But um, they will sometimes post their green card that shows how many pieces sold at each place. And that map that you saw now was kind of all the places we have Artemap machines. But many artists now kind of have a digital map, a Google map, and they show where they've sold their work. So they take pride in the fact that they were here and they, they really enjoy it. Obviously, everybody grew up a prototype kit. Yes. Potentially, something. Yeah. You know, what is that? Well, well, I'll be here after the mic's off to talk closer. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be questions after this is this is turned off. But as far as submitting, we need to see a physical prototype of what your concept is, and. Um, I used to approve all prototypes and other people have done it because they're a little more graceful with their verbiage. <laughs> right now there's someone, Suzanne, who's really great. Uh, we're always going to have feedback because there's it can be the most beautiful work in the world, but there's going to be something that could kind of help help it in the process of Artemat. So, um, so A, it has to be a concept that, that you know, will be valid to be an Artemat. But then on the other half of that, it has to be technically sound so it will vend properly. That means weight, nothing that can cause it to jam, any sort of weird shapes. Um, and then it needs to have some sort of PR so that someone who, who buys the machine and takes it two, two steps away We'll have some way to have context, like how to find you. Uh, and that's where payoff can happen at times, where you make connections beyond the just the vend process. So what you want to do is you have a, um, a captive audience, per se. You're right in their hands. So that's where you should think about how your work will will work after it's vended. And we've had some lanky times in our process uh, where the work was not very good. Uh, I think that when I was younger, I would I was under the the mindset that you know anyone can. Well, I still think anyone can make art, but I was letting in things that really were not worth the money. I'll just be honest. So so that's where we sometimes help artists who are struggling with with our process because pay is not that great, but the payoff can be good with connections and PR and things down the line. But it needs to be worth end price to the person that bought it. So, um, so there's little tricks that can really make a piece stronger. Um, and you may not consider it. Some artists are living in their bubble when they, they don't, Really great artists I know to this day who have been involved in Artemat. If uh, change one thing, they almost have a meltdown. But that's the nature of it. <laughs> but yeah, it needs to be structurally sound. The boxes need to be packed with with something that will keep it from crushing blocks or self swing. It just needs to go through the machine. The acetate is what helps it slide out because it goes from the bottom bottom out first, so there could be 10 pieces on top. So the acetate helps it be slick to go down. The whole machine works like a sliding board, you know, basically. So. But as far as concepts, I, I'm, I love to see ideas. Um, it's amazing how some artists will bring something to the table that we have never seen before. 
to this day. It's really exciting. Um, crafty stuff is getting a little, a little old. Like, um, don't clean out your junk drawer and glue it together and think we can sell it. <laughs> think it through a little bit. I mean, if you have an idea behind it. Uh, one of our one of our hosts, she in Santa Fe, uh, she doesn't want jewelry anymore because she said most of it is gumball-y. It's kind of a an adjective that hurt my feelings at first, but it was made sense because uh, she was talking about one or two artists that would just use random yarn as a necklace and pink yarn with a button glued to another button. That doesn't work. But uh, but utilize this as a something that would reflect well for you as an artist. Make it part of your practice. Make it something so that you'll be proud to say you're involved in Artemat, and and you'll actually be able to reach people that you may not be able to connect with via your glowing rectangle. So how many pieces is the artist committing to that first go round? Well, we like, there's no, nothing set in stone. We prefer to have 50, just because most of our hosts will order five to 10 pieces. So that, that's, you know, not that many machines, if you think about it. Um, some hosts will order 20 pieces, but that's not common. So just so that we can get you established for hosts, may want to ask for your stuff, um, you know, we need more quantity. So don't overthink, I mean, on the prototype process, yeah, think it through. Once you're in production, don't overthink it. So come up with something that balances the art versus commerce so that you're not burning out. Um, we have one or two artists who are friends of mine ever since I moved to Winston in 97. They'll make 50 pieces a month, and they, they just like it. They, they kind of use it as a way to relax on, in the evenings. So they just kind of just go through it. We have other artists who, like printmakers, I mean, they really load us down two, 300 pieces at a time. But that's their style. They, most of the work is done on the front end with the plate or the screen print. So depending on what you do, uh, we just, we can discuss all that if you have any questions or concerns, you know. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for like lots of unique printmakers that like hundred pieces, maybe have some variation? Or yeah, most most printmakers will have like a um, a range of prints. We have one guy who started out with lithographs, metal plates, then he went to linoleum. But he's been using the same plates for almost 20 years, but he has about 20 different images now and just, you know, recycles those images. And that's fine. Digital prints are unsellable. I think it still has the stigma of goes or something. You do have one artist that does digital prints, but but that's what he does for his art anyway. He's more like a urbanish poster artist, so it makes sense. But anyone who shrinks down something they did on the wall, who trying to hold off from doing that, even though we need art. But um, there's things that have, have stigma. But you know, there's still valid in the art of math, like collage. Everyone has done collage in elementary school. So uh, we've had some artists who just put like two things on a block. And it's like, I want to make them do something. <laughs> you know, uh, photography, everyone's had drugstore cameras before. So photography, the snapshotty is not usually that great. Even though I do um, Instax photographs from my work. So but that's a, each, each one is like a Polaroid, so at least it's original. <laughs> so, again, that goes back to the art versus commerce thing of what you feel comfortable producing. You know, there's 
one artist who did landscapes, who wasn't in that, but she did similar landscapes to that one. She tried to do prints and she got more frustrated with it because she was spending more time pounding and cutting than just painting. So she'll load us down 50 originals. And so she'll probably paint 20 blocks at one time while the paint's on each color. So she has a technique that goes through it fairly comfortably. But, um, you know, we sell things for five bucks. The artist gets 50%, which not much money, but um, but we're we're doing our best to treat everyone with respect, and we're getting artists in places that couldn't have access to otherwise. Sometimes we catch a lot of heat for that. Um, the ones that um, really come at me, I've had a few of that with the people are tense now, especially with the pandemic. And, and we're, as we're bouncing back, we're on our Instagram feed. Um, people are following us and some artists who have been involved and aren't involved anymore. They wanted to do prints. One came at me pretty aggressively, said some mean things. Um, and she didn't really show me what she wanted to do. I finally got to see what she was wanting to do. And it, it was not very exciting to me. Um, so usually people who don't see the bigger picture have other things going on in their lives that maybe they shouldn't be involved in art and math. The ones who are involved for the most part are ones who have practice outside of just art and math. Like someone's just looking at art and math for what it is. Unless you're, I mean, if you're just looking at the money, probably not going to be a good thing. But if you kind of use it in conjunction with with social media and showing where you've been, and you're reaching people like real people on the other end of the of this. Uh, people who make decisions, and I don't know how you initially found an artimat, but we're here because somebody wanted it here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I yeah. Right. Well, then, you know, many cases, somebody will buy from an artimat, like, oh, we want this in our museum. So we're reaching people that are beneficial. Still a sleeper, though. You, you know, if you um, if you play it up a little bit, you'll maybe hear from more people. My mom and Naoko, the Japanese artist, they put little notes like, I want to know where I end up please email me. And, and they would hear from people all the time. My mom just got a picture from someone that said, you he makes little birds now. Said, I wanted to show you that your little bird is now living in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's in my office on the windowsill, not in the museum proper, but it's in the, So she sent a picture and it's just sitting there in the office and see the skyline in the background. So, you know, that's the type of thing that actually is because then you have direct dialogue with somebody on the other end. I think it's gratifying. <laughs> it's both. Uh, the pandemic has brought back machines. Um, it's been a good thing and a bad thing. I think I'm gel shocked from it. Uh, I'm sure we all do, but. It's been rough at times. But um, machines are coming back, and times they come back in a way that's not very graceful. Like one of our hosts used all sorts of sexual assault, drugged out of his head, um, fled the state. The machine was left there dead. I had to get a machine back from Denver, pay a lot to get it out before the landlord scrapped it. <laughs> You know, but that machine's now near Charleston. Uh, anyway, I have about 100 machines in storage, and just got 25 from a vending guy in Kansas City. He gave them to me, but I had to ship them to North Carolina. He said, I just love what you do. Just Plus, it'll keep me from having to 
pay someone to haul them off. It's like, all right, I'll take them. And uh, one of them I'm real excited to work on. It came from something ballroom, the uh, the Beaumont or something. The, it was a weird bar in Kansas City that had loud punk shows, underage shows in the early 2000s. Probably the Limp Biscuit. And What's the other insane clown pies? I mean, all that stuff, you know, little corn, corn ish. Um, so it saw a lot of noise. Let's just leave it. It looks like it's been in a, in a rough place. Well, um, apparently, all the youngins would have to get out at midnight or 11 o'clock. And then the line dancers would come in drunk until 3 in the morning, line dancing. So party all night. But the loud ones with the cutoffs down to here and tattoos and stuff, they, they were out of there early. But uh, the machine has stickers all over, over it, and at least on the glass. And I've looked up some of the bands. Most of them aren't in bands anymore, but it's like, yeah, that came from, I want to know where the machine came from. It's like, yeah, that came from the Beaumont. I remember it. You know, and um, find a, a comparably loud music venue and have the bands touring stick their stickers on it and just cover it. So maybe in 10 years, it would, you won't even see anything of the metal anymore, just be covered in stickers. And it'd just say Artemat in a little, little area on the side. But, but, you know, do each machine has a previous life. And sometimes I really love knowing about where it was. I don't not certain where this one came from. It, it was an early one in Artemat, but it came from Winston Salem, probably from an office. It's in decent shape. It wasn't in a bar, I don't think. But some of the other ones came from legendary places across the country. Um, one, the yellow one in Vegas that was in the picture, um, it came from a gas station in Newport, Rhode Island, which is in the middle of the street. So this was back in the 40s. Where you could just, and it wasn't, it was a rural island. It was built up and all the rich people are there and mansions and all that stuff. Um, busy. But, now, but then it was just like maybe a, a boating, fishing island. You could pull up right there in the middle of the road and get gas. Maybe the car would have to go around you a little bit. Uh, so the gas station is still there. Maybe a restaurant now. Uh, but that machine came from that place. Which is kind of cool. There's one at the Omni at the ballpark. I was there fixing it. They were pretty rough on it. They broke a bunch of knobs, so I don't know what type of clientele the Omni on the ballpark is bringing in. <laughs> so we're going to have to ship down some knobs uh, this week when I get back. But, you know, they. Friday, they said, uh, hey, our machine's having trouble. And then they didn't even tell me. They're, I don't know. They're good people, just they're frazzled. All the hotels are running on empty. <laughs> they're frantic. So, but yeah, Atlanta. And then there's one in Sugar Hill, that, um, the E Center, which is that one's. And that one was in. Uh, Oregon. So, you know, lots of time in the machines, the relationship goes south. I'll spruce them up and send them back out. So, um, you know, it depends. The, the, the pandemic has made it more obvious for the problems that venues had. So some are still around, just they having a hard time managing things. I think that's inherent with their model. Others closed. Uh, you know, most people, though, they would let me know if it was going, they had to, something was going to change. So it's living, breathing. It's always, it's never sitting still. <laughs> so I'm shipping a machine right now to a, um, a jazz bar in Columbus, Ohio. I have one in the works for the momentary, which is part of Crystal Bridges, the 
Walmart family. And the momentary is this big complex that used to be where they made Velveeta. So it's like a, I think there's a brewery in there and the momentary does more living artists and very risky stuff there. Yep. So I need to finish that machine. I've been metal blocking on the design. <laughs> Well, these are um, our prototype kits that we sell. And Allison can maybe say what's going to happen with okay, everything yeah, on the yeah, table. We're do a little... Everybody get a. Uh, Turn off the mic gravel. at this point. <laughs> but if there's another question. What's your favorite machine? <laughs> Yeah. I'm not sure how to. Um, I was like, 